Welcome to Finite Element Methods. Now we'll be discussing a solid mechanics example. So let's work through that. In this example, what I'm going to show you is a domain that looks like this. And in this domain, what we're going to do is uh, apply attraction force on this top surface of this square element. And then a shear force, traction also on this triangular element. This distance is B b and b so this is a domain i'm talking about uh this is according to x and y we're going to apply gravity as well so given an aluminum structure we want to subject it to this tangential load the dimensions here is b equals three the plate thickness is one inch and i want to figure out how to solve this first step let's discretize this domain so the domain is all this uh, area uh, we will then divide this domain to a square here one and then this triangular element two so i'm going to select a, a, a q4 element for this uh, square and notice that i'm going to number my nodes now one two three four five you can number them any way you want the important the connectivity needs to be correct so for element number one node id is one node id is two node id is four node id is five okay so these are the nodes that comprise element number one element number two is a constant strain triangular element which comprises of node three four and two notice i selected here three four and two three four and two i could have done two three four but this is why i chose to do it and so from there i'm ready now to calculate um, what are the degrees of freedom that need to be considered at each node because I have two degrees of freedom per node when I was working on heat transfer problems that was less of a concern but now there's multiple degrees of freedom per node so and I, ha I have to account for that so um, these are the nodal numbers but they don't necessarily re represent the degree of freedom so you'll see that for each node I am making sure that I'm tracking the degrees of freedom. I have one and two for node number one. For node number two, I have three and four as the degrees of freedom. Node number four, I have six and seven. And node number five, which is this one here, is seven and eight. Then I go to a triangular element. And node number three is this one. So I'm calling that nodes degrees of freedom five and six. Okay, um, so I made an error, so I corrected it, but there's supposed to be 10 degrees of freedom total, two per node. And you can see here that um, I've corrected it. So let's look again. So node number one has degrees of freedom one and two. Node number two has degrees of freedom three and four. Node number four has degrees of freedom six and seven. Node number five has degrees of freedom seven and eight. Then when I look at the triangular element, I'm looking at node number three as having degrees of freedom nine and 10. Uh, node number four has degrees of freedom six and seven, just like I have it here. And node number two has here, which is here, these nodes are shared, so it has the same degrees of freedom. So that's sort of the connectivity process that needs to be followed because you're gonna use that for the assembly process very important we don't want to miss that very important consideration in the formulation so so let's let's try to tackle this let's look at this uh, square element uh, that square element has to we need to specify the coordinates you can see here that selected this at the origin so this is zero zero three comma zero and so forth so I have to use that same order I use in the connectivity. I shouldn't go any other order. So I started with one, two, four, five. My coordinates have to follow that. So I have zero, zero for node number one. And then for node number two, I have three comma three, zero. So X and Y. And then I have for node number four, I have three, three. And then for node number five, I have zero, three x and zero and y is three that makes sense that's a height 
again, I invite you to do it yourself. Uh, and the shape functions are easy for a square element. We know what they are. And even if it's quadrilateral, it doesn't matter because I'm using an actual parametric formulation. Uh, but I know what N1, N2, N3, N4 are. And if I find this derivative with respect to C, you know, if I were to find this derivative, what I'll find is that uh, given this equation here and given the shape functions for a quadrilateral element, which I already gave you N1, N2, N3, N4 in previous lectures, this right here becomes three halves and three halves. J inverse needs to be calculated often. That gives you two thirds and two thirds. The determinant of J gives you nine fourths. We need that information as well for the formulation. Uh, this information is then you. this J inverse will be used here to calculate these derivatives that are needed. Um, we know the shape functions, so we can find these derivatives. When you multiply this by that, you will get that we can find these derivatives of this stuff. I can, this has to be done for N2, N3, and N4. The good news is uh, that this Jacobian is the same. The shape functions N1, N2, N3, and N4 change because they're different for each node. But that should be easy to do. These are easy calculations. So these are the calculations I need to do ahead of time. So now element number one, I have four blocks. One, two, three, four blocks because I have four nodes. And so here I am, I'm ready to go. This is, this is the strain deflection relationship that needed to be calculated as required by the stiffness matrix, if you recall from the 2D finite element formulation. Uh, I know these derivatives now because I found them through this procedure. So all I have to do is populate these blocks, each of these blocks, using the information from these calculations. Once I do that, I can get B bold and B bold is all this stuff. Um, this can now be substituted into this equation and be integrated. You don't have to do it numerically. You could do the integral. You can do the integral numerically, not exactly. I know the Jacobian, the determinant is just this value nine over four. That's easy. Now my integrals go from minus one to one. And then I have this term that has to do with the, the gravity load. So you can see here the body force is zero in the X direction because there's no body force in the X direction. There's only a body force going downwards minus rho G. That's why you see that there. The Jacobian, uh, the, the, the determinant has to be found because this body force is acting on the whole area, volume of the material. So that's why this should be an integral over the area times the thickness H gives you volume. Notice the H there is constant thickness is about one inch, I believe I said. So uh, this is the matrix of shape functions in bold times B bold. And we, we have not done anything different here. This is the formulation we had, M bold transpose times B bold, right? M bold transpose times B bold, that's a body forces. We are calculating each of these things. We calculated B bold, we're done there. We know C bold, we know this. We're just calculating this stuff. And now we have to deal with this stuff, the traction forces. So we're done finding M bold here. This is done. M bold, we know how to calculate, it's easy. M bold transpose this, this one here. But now we have to calculate this right here. And that's gonna take some work to understand how to deal with. So we know that for element one, which is this one right here, the traction is applied along this edge. So what I'm going to do, I know that the traction tau naught is in the x direction. So that's that value in the y direction is zero because that traction is pointed to the right on this surface. So I'm gonna put here that this line element is only applied to four or five. So it's only, we're only applying along this edge. So we have to be smart about that. Now recall that we discussed how I'm going to deal, deal 
with this quantity here. So the first step is to determine what DL really is. We're applying attraction here. So let's look at the nodal connectivity. We said that this first, this element has nodes one, two, four, five in that order. So following that same order, one, two, three, four, that means that this is the edge that we're talking about, the three, four edge in the natural coordinate system, that's the one we're talking about. In the global coordinate system is four or five, but in the local is three, four. So that's it. That's where I'm applying the traction tau naught. And so that's the one I'm tracking here, this one here. And so the integral has to be over deep C, right? Because that's along this edge. So that's deep C. And I have to find the line element. The line element is partial of X with respect to C, partial of Y with respect to C, square the deep sea cancels out and so that's why that's the right edge and that's the right way to write it but this has to be valid along this edge which is eta equals one and so that's why you see this eta equals one being evaluated there this also this whole thing has to be valid eta equals one as well the shape functions uh and here what i've done i've already multiplied this whole thing by this column vector that's why everything looks more simplified. Here, you can also see it multiply this whole thing by this column vector, which is why this looks a lot more simplified. And this makes sense. You can see that these forces are acting in the y direction because gravity acts in the y direction, while these forces are acting in the x direction because that's how I'm, I'm applying the traction forces. Now let's look at uh, what we have then. Well, we can further do this calculation here on the right, by the way, because I know the partial of x with respect to c. I know that. Um, and I know that from this calculation here, partial of x with respect to c, I know that. It's three halves. So I know this number, this number. I can do this whole calculation. Once I'm done with this whole calculation and I multiply everything out, notice how uh, everything simplifies to plus three halves and all this stuff that you see here. So this is the element formulation for element number one. Uh, everything here to me makes sense. You can see that these for node number one, two, and then now these are the ones related to these nodes here at the top. So that makes sense why they're showing up here and not at the top here. But everything makes sense. You're ready now to use numerical integration to integrate the whole thing and calculate the solution. Well, you, you can't calculate a solution yet. You have to do the assembly process first. For element number two is this one here, this triangular element here. And I started with this node, that node and that node. So this node is at six zero, X is six, Y is zero. This node here is a height of three and a location of three in the X direction. So three, three. And then node number two is the third node I chose is three, zero. You can see here that I can use the shape functions again. C bold is these coordinates that go in here. And I can plug this whole thing in here uh, to then calculate these derivatives. Because I know the shape functions in the triangular system, uh, the shape functions are one minus R minus S. The other one is R and the other one is S. So those are the shape functions. I can calculate this derivative this very straightforward manner. Uh, and I get minus three, three, minus three, zero, and J inverse is just this. And the determinant is just a number, is nine. I can calculate these partial derivatives uh, very easily by using the Jacobian, the inverse of the Jacobian times these derivatives. Notice how these derivatives are constant. That's why it's called a constant strain triangle element because the strains will be constant for every triangle. The partial n to respect to x, partial n to respect to y can be calculated as well. Notice how I can get the values in a straightforward manner for all three of them. Then I can plug it in, plug it in into the blocks. So block one, two, and three. And B bold is this whole thing. Very similar procedure now, right? So these are um, the shift function for triangular element. 
that's the body forces. Again, all we're doing right now is substituting in, in this equation for triangular element. So M bold transpose B bold, M bold transpose traction bold. That's effectively what we're doing. And you may ask me where this came from. Well, you can see that the tractions are applied in the X and Y direction. So tau naught, I have a component of tau naught in the X and the Y. So that's where this came from. Using just trigonometry, you can figure that out. But now I have to deal, I have to deal with that edge, right? We have to deal with that edge. The integral has to be dealt with. So I did a little trick and the trick I chose was that I selected this as first node and second node so that this edge is the one that's, uh, in, when you look at the right hand triangle, the, the triangular element, we're going along the R direction. And that simplifies things a lot by doing that. And uh, we integrate um, in the R coordinate system, set S equals zero. And now the integral is very simple to do for that traction force. So the little trick that we've used to, to get us there quicker, right? Um, and now this calculation is fairly straightforward. Uh, and when you integrate the whole thing, these are the numbers you get. Very simple, very, very effective, and it gets us there. So again, uh, I was very, very strategic uh, about how I selected that traction, how I selected these nodes. I selected in such a way that this edge maps into this edge here. So look at the numbering system, one, two, and three, and the way I selected the nodes were three, four, and two. And I did it on purpose, so this edge on purpose maps into this edge, which is straight. And so that integral is easy to do. It's integral from r equals zero to r equals one, and not only that, this edge is just simple. Uh, I can, S is zero on this edge. So when I look at this integral, it really simplifies life a lot. That integral is easy. This is dr. This is very easy to calculate. Again, the Jacobian, the determinant of Jacobian has to be calculated as well. So we can now assemble the using the degrees of freedom assemble uh, the system to come up with a the stiffness matrix apply the boundary conditions solve for the nodal deflections and once these deflections are known you can calculate the strains and once you know the strains you can calculate the stresses uh, the stresses can be computed at the integration points and, and you can do that fairly effectively uh, so given the nodal values given b bold given the constitutive law, you can multiply this whole thing out to get the stresses. And that's very effective uh, to do. Notice that B bold um, depends on, could depend on, on the corner system, the natural corner system. So you have to basically determine what this value is. Um, and this stress can vary across the element because B bold can vary. C bold cannot vary. Is the constitutive law, Q bold is fixed. You know the nodal values now because you've found them. But B bold varies, so you can plot stress across the element. With that said, I thank you for listening to this 2D lecture on an example problem on how to deal with this. But now I'll move next to element performance. Thank you so much for listening and have a good day.